most CrossFit athletes just flat out do run training wrong. Either they only do it when it's thrown into like the middle of a Metcon when they're already breathing and super tired, or they try to do it a little more comprehensively and they end up searching and finding a run program that was written by runners for runners. And as we know, CrossFit and the testing body of the sport is forever changing. And when you're asked to run, it's certainly not always when you're fresh. Often it's paired with unsustainable high output movements that put the athlete into a, a bit of a deficit, like a, a bad place, metabolically speaking, and it makes it really hard to actually run well. So let's fix that. Today, I want to discuss run development for CrossFit athletes. The fitness movement is brought to you by Zor Fitness. We offer coaching and individualized program design, as well as educational content for coaches and athletes. It's all at one place, zorfitness.com. So the outline of today's show, I want to start off by talking about the difference between specific and general systems, meaning you can have run specific capacity and you can also have generalized capacity and how do those two interplay uh, for the CrossFit athlete. And then I want to kind of go through how I think about building the run pattern specifically for the athletes that I work with and how I sort of fit that into uh, somebody's like skeleton of their week. Like how, well, where might you fit that best uh, into their weekly programming? And then I want to talk about briefly the benefits of run training for the CrossFit athlete. And then how might you actually incorporate it, right? Based on your ability level, with whether you're more just like a, a recreational, everyday competitive CrossFitter versus if you're a high level athlete, how might those two things differ? And how have I seen it work well for each of those types of level of athlete? So, first, specific versus general systems. Again, pattern specific adaptations versus generalized adaptations globally throughout the entire body. So, for runners, if someone's identifies as a movement, right? They are someone who runs full time. Like that's like their thing, right? If that's the case, then their run training is going to have to address both the general and the specific capacity. It is going to be both done through running, right? Unless they're doing a substantial amount of cross training, like, you know, getting on bikes or other ergs uh, from time to time, likely even if they're doing more generalized training, it's often still run based. Um, which is something that could be dramatically different for a runner versus a, a CrossFit athlete. So for example, say they run like five times a week, they might be doing two to three of those days would be like really only easy work, right? Where the primary goal might be like, they, they would probably use the language of like building their their quote unquote base or aerobic endurance, right? With the, the end goal being probably to improve aerobic capacity down the road. So for CrossFit athletes, I would argue that a lot of their general capacity and systems are already pretty quite developed, to be honest. So for example, a runner might have a strength program that's built around joint health and building up just a, a rudimentary level of strength and some of the, the primary movements, like probably doing a, a decent amount of hinging, um, core work, things like that. So for a CrossFit athlete, a lot of those qualities are already taken care of because they're doing a substantial amount, way more than a runner in terms of strength training. They have a way more finely tuned nervous system for strength training specifically. They have more reps accumulated. They just have a higher ceiling for strength. And along with that comes the fact that they're doing things like Olympic lifts where they're having to already get into deep end ranges and likely their range of motion is pretty good. If they're a high level CrossFit athlete, they likely have all the range of motion, all the power development, all the joint integrity that they already need, as well as um, a lot of those endurance qualities. You know, they probably have the cardiac and pulmonary function already built up to a, a pretty substantial level just from the fact that if this is someone who's been doing CrossFit for a period of time. And especially if this is someone who's more detail oriented on how they go about their their you know process, they'll often have a coach who's giving them um, not just like hard metcons all the time, but like you know zone work and things like that. They're gonna again augment and support uh, the adaptations they get out of their CrossFit metcons. My point being that a lot of CrossFit athletes already have a lot of those generalized systems to a pretty high level, so they're not gonna need or be able to tolerate nearly as much of that like base building that some of like the runners would do in like their off season phase. So I would argue then for a CrossFit athlete, it becomes more about developing specific pattern tolerance, like building up that run pattern so that is sustainable. And that will translate to running powerfully, AKA quickly down the road. 
So then the question becomes, how do we build the run pattern? How do we improve the, the functioning of that movement for the athlete? And it's generally not much different than other movements. So if you've been trying to develop your toes to bar or your dumbbell snatch or handstand pushups, you'd go through a similar process where you might start with like solo volume quality focused, right? So just doing relatively unfatigued bouts of work with that specific movement with the goal being to keep the quality as high as possible. Then you might add in cyclical elements to increase the general fatigue around that thing. Um, and then you might start to do intervals of more sport specific work. And then you would probably remix it into the sport with testers and other high level uh, metcons and things like that. So you can certainly do that with run training. However, there's one thing that is definitely different about running because it is a cyclical modality that is very different than things like, you know, handstand pushups or toes to bar. So that I mentioned, which are going to be gymnastics uh, based is that with something like running in a cyclical modality, you can do continuous work. Whereas toes to bar, you cannot do that, right? You can't do 45 minutes of toes to bar continuously, but you should be able to run at a pace that allows you to move continuously for 45 minutes, for example. So I would say here, like likely you might not be able to start with like 45 minutes for a lot of athletes if they haven't been doing much running already, or they do very little or no running already, but you might be able to start them at 15 or 20 minutes. So for a lot of the people that I work with, I like to start them at a slightly higher run volume. However, you just can't give them more if they're not ready to handle that. So how I often go about this is giving them bouts of run walk training, and that allows them to stay easy and relaxed when they're actually in the run because they're not trying to do extended bouts of work. Likely if they go to a pace that allows them to do 45 minutes or 60 minutes of continuous running, it's going to be so slow that it really doesn't mimic what running in the sport will actually look like, which that is the goal is to have a specific pattern being built. And if you run very slowly, the primary thing that's, that's going to do is get you better at running slowly. And that's obviously not the, the end goal. So often run walk intervals for a lot of my athletes where it's slightly faster run paces that mimic a little bit closer to competition, still not all the way there just yet, but then interlacing that uh, rest or walk intervals along with that so that the athlete can make the whole thing sustainable. So how do I think about fitting in run training into athletes programming? Uh, I would say, let's just pretend we have people who are maybe at an open or quarterfinals level. Um, they're not like going to an in-person semifinal where you might see running, or they're not going to a bunch of um, in-person high level competitions where again, they're gonna see running. I would say generally, I, I do like to get athletes running even if they're at an open or quarterfinals level. However, the reality is, they're really not going to have running be a critical component of the testing body. Maybe you'll see something like a shuttle run. However, you're not going to see these big chunks of running or something that's going to be uh, like just like traditional running in like a, a rounds for time type environment with like a 400, 800 meter run. You're just not going to see that. So for these athletes, I, I still like incorporating that run training because it has some very distinct benefits, which we'll go over here in a second. Although you just got to kind of know that it's going to be on the grand list of priorities, just relatively low on that list, frankly. So I would say that like the main benefits for running, especially as someone, you know, besides the direct carryover, right? If we have a higher level athlete, they're going to be asked to run. So it's important that they can obviously have specific capacity. However, even if an athlete isn't asked to run, I still think that there's benefits to doing at least some run training. One, because I think it drives systemic qualities more so than any other erg based uh, cyclical movement. There's something unique about having to carry the engine, right? Meaning that you are manipulating your own body weight through space. And it's such a fundamental human skill and motor pattern to have that I think it's worth developing for every athlete. I also think it brings those generalized qualities that I talked about earlier. That's one of the primary goals if you're doing run training for someone who's not getting tested in it is that it has carryover to these other things. So that's the, the first thing, right? The systemic qualities that it's driving. And then two is because say the athlete has a change in goals or they you know make it to a, a semifinal or they go to a, a big in-person event and they're they're not solely focused on like open and quarters where it's like this online qualifier environment if you go to an event even if it's a local competition you very well could be asked to run and you are very likely to be asked to run or at least transition quickly in between elements and move on the floor so it's important that you can move your body through space, through multiple rounds, even if you're not still asked to run. And likely in those things, then you will be. And if that happens, you'll be set up much better 
where then you can have a much shorter trajectory to get up to speed in terms of like having some real run capacity then. Whereas if you just completely neglect run training, you haven't done it at all. And now it's like, oh, I signed up for this competition in six weeks or whatever. Now I have to gear up for it. It's like that puts you into a bad place in terms of like trying to be too aggressive with your training. It would be much wiser to have at least some minimal amount of run training like retained in your program so that if you go to an in-person event like that and you do increase the volume or increase the intensity or increase the touches in a particular week, that you're not going to be dealing with a ton of joint irritation as a result. And also just the fact that you'll get better adaptations quicker because you've already had some exposures to it. So how should you incorporate this, this run training if you are a non-elite athlete, which is just about everybody listening to this. It's like, well, if you already are doing some zone work or easy accumulation style EMOMs, things along those lines, that's just like sub-maximal work, then you can certainly involve running into that or replace one of those things. For example, um, say you do like you know, three times a week in the mornings, you do some zone two work, for example, which is becoming more and more popular for people in the CrossFit space. It's like, if that's the case, maybe you take one of those and you say, okay, I'm not going to bike on this day. And instead, I'm going to go out and run. Simple things where you just simply sub it out and make sure you get some amount of run training in. Or for example, if it's like a, a rotating EMOM and you have it like row, bike, ski, you could maybe take out the ski and put in the run, for example, the one week. So really practical things that aren't super time intensive. They don't take any more thought or coordination besides that. And then I would say like you could occasionally start to add in run training either as a warm up or as a finisher. So either like the front or the back end of one of your sessions, again, sub maxable, just building up some tolerance in a relatively easy environment. So you could jump on an air runner, 15 minute EMOM, 30 seconds at a smooth pace running, 30 second walk, something like that. That gets you nice and warm. You're ready to go for your workout. And at the same time, you're not going to be beat up or sore or tired from doing that work. Likewise, you could add something similar to that. You know, at the end of your session, maybe it's just like, okay, maybe I do four by 400 meter run at just like a, a smooth pace, like maybe a two to three time trial, two to three mile time trial pace uh, with like, you know, plenty of rest in there. Maybe you walk two minutes between those 400s or something like that. So it's about a one to one. Just a way that that's not going to, again, be super taxing. It's not going to be super draining from your other work. And it's a way to, again, allow you to build up quickly in the event that you feel like you need to uh, actually address some run training down the road. And then I would say you can just throw it into your mix work occasionally, right? So if you're writing Metcons, add some some workouts that have some 400 to 800 meter runs or a you know one mile run buy-in or something to your workout. Again, it doesn't have to be super complicated. Getting involved some of the time year round will really have again, dramatic benefits to actually when you go to uh, introduce it more formally. So here's three examples. I actually pulled these from uh, athletes training. Uh, the one was a replacement for uh, running into the zone work. The other one was that run walk tolerance build that I talked about. And the third one was a one that's mixed into uh, mixed work, a Metcon. So the first one, 45 minute EMOM, minute one, air bike, minute two, row, minute three was ski. I replaced that with run. So it's air bike, row, run. Just building up, again, some really low density, low threshold uh, run work. The second one, I gave this to one of my athletes on one of their days where it was, I wanted a little bit of extra conditioning as well as just a touch on the run training. This is where I gave them that run walk intervals to start to build up, again, more of that tolerance. Five total rounds, which is going to be 25 minutes. One minute run at an easy pace, nasal breathing only. Two minute run at an estimated 5K time trial pace. Two minute walk at a brisk pace. Again, nasal breathing only. Uh, so, again, super simple, just you know, running at an easy pace, running at a you know, moderate pace for that long 5K time trial pace for two minutes is not challenging. And a two minute walk, which is going to obviously allow them to recover. Uh, the third example was uh, a Metcon four rounds for time, 400 meter run, 20 toes to bar. 10 bar facing burpees. So the primary goal of this workout for the athlete that I wrote this for was really just getting them a, a touch of something that uh, was going to get their breathing escalated for uh, an extended work bout and start to build confidence as we approach the season. Four rounds for time, 400 meter run, 20 toes to bar, 10 bar facing burpee. And one of the keys here is that the run training can't always be in mixed settings. So if you only just throw it in the Metcons, it's only ever going to get so good. 
if you only do a skill in a testing environment, a high fatigue, like say you struggle with ring muscle ups, you only do them in a, in mechons when you're already tired and you've already done all this work and you're you know sloppy at that point, then it's like you're really aren't going to build much capacity in that movement specifically. And you're just teaching yourself that the movement is always going to feel hard and that you associate painful sensations with that thing. So it's also important that you do lower intensities of that movement and then you do it in solo settings at times, meaning on its own. And that will actually help you build real capacity so you can actually run fast when you're in your mixed work. So now let's talk about run development for a higher level athlete. So say this person's at least at like a semifinals level, if not more. I would say all the same principles apply that we already had talked about, but now the athlete is just going to probably have more resources and is more willing to devote adaptation currency as a, as a thought towards building that pattern specifically, because again, it's going to be a much bigger priority for them in their season because the way that the movement is actually tested is also dramatically shifting and is dramatically more important as the season goes on. So for semifinals, obviously run training is going to be way more important than at quarterfinals. The games, it's extremely important. One of the most important qualities that an athlete could have is that they're a good runner at the games, which is not the case necessarily as something like a semifinals or a quarterfinals. So again, the the higher and further and deeper you go into the game season is more and more important for a CrossFit athlete to be really, really adept at running. So run training will be more similar to what a runner would actually be doing, I would argue, at this point, where now there might be multiple run sessions with you know, different focuses and intents behind each of those and kind of like a unique or specific purpose behind those things. Whereas before it was just kind of like, yeah, you wanted some touches throughout the week. Now it's a little bit more strategic and a little bit more, again, is actually being devoted, more resources being devoted towards that. So maybe, for example, they have, you know, three bouts of work throughout the week for, for running specifically, where maybe the one is a long, easy, continuous running. Uh, maybe one's like intervals of running, but they're at like kind of threshold paces, uh, faster stuff that's more like time trial or above type efforts uh, with some rest injected to keep things uh, moving well and the technique to be good. And then probably still having running in mixed settings, at least uh, maybe one touch of that throughout the week. So again, the examples here could just be as simple as like a 45 minute zone two run. Uh, the intervals example could be, you know, a 45 minute clock where you do a 300 meter run at your mile time trial pace. So pretty fast. Uh, pace and then recovery walk for two minutes doing that for 45 minutes 300 meter run two minute walk um, at the mile time trial pace and then the example of mixed work again this could take a number of different settings i just picked a, a example from the games because i thought that might be appropriate for a high level athlete three rounds for time this was helena uh, which they did at the 2023 crossfit games 400 meter run 12 bar muscle up 21 dumbbell snatch 50 slash 35 pounds for that so for a high level athlete let's say they are in the earlier stages of their season, they're probably going to have more of that zone work, easy running, or maybe run walking um, to keep things, again, the ability to basically build volume in that pattern. And then they might have like one threshold run with uh, faster intervals or something that's at like a tempo for a, kind of a, an extended work bout that's a little bit higher fatigue. And that might transition as they get closer to the season to doing like maybe one to two threshold type runs or intervals that are at a higher pace. And then one to two instances of a uh, running in mixed settings. Cause that's obviously going to be super important because even when running gets tested as something like the CrossFit games, a good chunk of the time it is in a more cyclical setting. For example, it might be a, a swim run. It might be a triathlon like they did the other year. It might be a uh, longer bouts of running. Like they did like a one and a half mile run, 30 toes to bars. And it was like doing that, you know, two, three times, something along those lines, much more extended bouts of work than you're going to see in the typical online qualifier or local comp scene. So it becomes more important for them to have solo run capacity in addition to mixed work run capacity. So where would I recommend people get started? Just like the, the person who's listening to this, who just wants to improve their overall run capacity and they're a CrossFitter. It's like, <laughs> just start by adding it in, right? Like don't overcomplicate it. Start with easy settings. Maybe you use it as a, an extended cyclical warm up, right? Maybe you do a few minutes on an erg just to get the, the calves and legs, you know, get some blood in there and the joints kind of lubricated and ready to go. And then you just do some some easy running to, uh, again, it's kind of serve as additional warm up. Or maybe you do, like I mentioned before, like a few like moderate 400s after your workout. Again, making sure they're actually 
smooth and relatively comfortable and not you're just not training them to be painful all the time. And then maybe you could mix them into some sort of like a rotating imam or skill work that is sub-maximal in nature. I think all those would probably be best places to start. And then, you know, if you do that and you do that for, you know, maybe a few weeks to a few months, then hopefully you've gotten to the point where you actually have built some run specific capacity and build up the run pattern enough where you are then confident to allow yourself to actually start to run faster in both solo and mixed work settings. And that's going to take some time and you're going to have to be a little bit more thoughtful in how you start to introduce it into Metcons if you really want that uh, capacity to translate. But I would say that's probably a good place to start. And actually, you'll be able to um, then train the run much more traditionally in how we would, would think about it and how you see it from a lot of other athletes. So there you go. That's how I think about run development for CrossFit athletes. Thanks for listening today. If you're someone who just started listening to the show, I would encourage you to subscribe so you can stay up to date. If you're someone who's been listening for a while, I would encourage you to rate and review the show. And lastly, the best thing that you can do to support our work is also the best thing that you can do for your performance. And that is by hiring one of our coaches. Until next time, stay the course.